of the nations are idle, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Why? Why must man go into space? You may be facing tribulation, but don't let it get you down. What I'm saying makes it patience. But you're gonna make it out I scratch my own two feet to pull you to safety When the fires are burning, burning like crazy Carnage, you're helpless, But you won't feel no pain I will take your place, I will be Thus saith the Lord God, I will also destroy the idols And I will cause their images to cease strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song will I praise him. Well, hello and welcome to Idol Killer, a ministry dedicated to destroying sacred cows for the cause of Christ. I'm your host, Warren McGrew, and uh, tonight we're going to be discussing dynamic omniscience. What exactly is this view? Who affirms dynamic omniscience? What are the implications for affirming it? Should we affirm it? What are the biblical and philosophical arguments for and against it? But before we dig into this fascinating topic, um, if you love studying theology, philosophy, and even dope trap beats to aid in Christian polemics, be sure to hit the like button and, uh, and subscribe for more content like this. If you want to become a fellow idol killer and help support the program, then please uh, consider joining us over on Patreon as well. Well, 
Uh, my guest tonight is Dr. Ryan Mullins. He's published over 30 essays on various topics in philosophical theology related to, goodness, models of God, philosophy of time, personal identity, the problem of evil, the Trinity, the incarnation. Ryan, the, the list just goes on. You also uh, published two books, which we have links to in the video description, End of the Timeless God and God in Emotion. And uh, you've held research and teaching fellowships at the University of Notre Dame. Is it Dom or Dame? It's, so it's in Indiana, so you say Dame. Uh, if you're Dame. in France, then you got to say it differently. But yeah, I, we're American, so. I, okay, I'm going to go with Dame, Notre yeah, Dame. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in the University of Cambridge, the University of St. Andrews, and the University of Edinburgh. Ryan, welcome to Idol Killer, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, man, it's, it's, it's a pleasure. Um, you know, this is a... This is one of those topics that I really uh, have just been drawn to, like a like a moth to flame. This whole idea of um, just the the workings of God and and the identity of God as revealed in Scripture and the various philosophical understandings that we've developed over the years, as far as understanding. Um, but um, I I know that there's some some questions out there as far as like well. Um, what dynamic omniscience is. And this term gets thrown around a lot, especially by me. <laughs> it gets thrown a lot by me in, in debates and online uh, content. And I'm not the first to use the term. Um, but what, what do you think are some, some popular definitions? Um, do you like them? Do you not like them? How, what do you understand about dynamic omniscience? Yeah, so sometimes dynamic omniscience is just said to be this denial of God's exhaustive foreknowledge, or just like the claim that God does not know the future. And I don't think that's like going to be terribly helpful, because it's not like a really nuanced account of dynamic uh, omniscience. And so I'll give you like two reasons why I'm not a big fan of this uh, particular account of dynamic omniscience. So first say that we take dynamic omniscience simply to, to mean a denial of divine exhaustive foreknowledge. Well, that's going to give us this really weird result. So everyone who affirms that God is timeless will be affirming that uh, God has this dynamic account of omniscience. And this is because proponents of divine timelessness constantly deny that God has foreknowledge. So, for example, people like Eleanor Stump and Paul Helm, they both say this in a lot of different places. Uh, so what classical theists are doing is they have to deny that God literally has foreknowledge because foreknowledge is a temporal notion. So it just literally means prior knowledge of a future state of affairs or knowing something before it happens. And a timeless God cannot stand in temporal relations like that. So it cannot literally have foreknowledge. So if you take dynamic omniscience just to simply be the denial of divine foreknowledge, you're going to end up with classical theism entailing uh, dynamic foreknowledge. Or I'm sorry, dynamic omniscience. And I, I don't I don't think that's going to be right because like later what I want to do in this episode is I want to argue that like Calvinists and Thomas like Stump and Helm like they should affirm dynamic omniscience, but I don't think that their view just like automatically entails dynamic omniscience. So that's that's one reason. Let me give you the second one. So say you take dynamic omniscience just to mean that God does not know the future. And, and again, you hear this a lot in a lot of the popular discourse, but that definition gives us, again, like this really weird result. So let's go back to Paul Helm, like a Calvinist and classical theist. So, so Helm affirms what's called the B theory of time, uh, and is an attempt to defend divine timelessness. And so on the, on the standard account of the B theory, there's no such thing as past, present, or future, um, uh, because all moments of time, of the timeline, like they equally exist, and they're ordered in like these before and after and simultaneous relations, uh, but there's no objective present, there's no objective past or future. And so what this means is like quite literally, there are no facts about what will happen in the future. And so there are no future facts for God to know because there are no future facts. So it entails that God doesn't know the future facts because there, there just aren't any. And so if dynamic omniscience simply means that God does not know the future facts, then Paul Helm and then every B theorist is going to be forced to affirm the dynamic theory of, uh, of omniscience. And that, that just seems like the wrong result again, because it just seems like you need a more nuanced account uh, or like a nuanced definition of dynamic omniscience to figure out what these debates are really about. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I try to simplify it for my own understanding and, and just take dynamic to mean active and energetic, that there is some activity with regard to how God knows this. Mm -hmm. um, how, how would you, I mean, how, 
how would you even go about building a, 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 a better definition? What would that, what would that look like? Yeah. So, so when I looked at John Sanders uh, account of, of uh, dynamic omniscience, because he's the first person I'm aware of to use this term. So we've got these two different words here. You've got dynamic and you've got omniscience. And so the omniscience part, like that's pretty standard. Like Sanders doesn't say anything uh, controversial there. So Sanders, like pretty much everyone else says that God knows the truth values of all propositions. So basically God knows all of the facts about reality. And, and so no one in these debates uh, thinks that God is ignorant of certain facts. Like I don't, I don't know anyone who's going to say like, oh yeah, we believe in an ignorant God. Everyone wants to say God knows all the facts. So Calvinists, Molinists, open theists, whatever, they're all going to affirm God knows all of the facts. But the debate, it seems to me, is about which facts are in the world for God to know. So that's the omniscience word. So let's let's look at that other word. And so the word dynamic, I think that should give us a clue about what kind of facts that Sanders and some other people are wanting to affirm. So when Sanders affirms dynamic omniscience, he's relying on something called the dynamic theory of time in which there are tensed facts about the past, present, and future. Uh, and so tense facts uh, are about what is happening like right now in the present, like what did happen in the past and what will happen in the future. So for example, like uh, Ryan is talking to Warren right now, like that, like that's a tensed fact because it makes some kind of implicit or like an explicit reference to ob the objective present moment of time. And so the dynamic theory of time says that there's all these tense facts about the past, present, and future. But then it further says that these tense facts change as history unfolds. So consider again that tense fact I mentioned a second ago. So Ryan is talking to Warren right now. So earlier that tense fact was false. Now it's true, but then later on it's going to be false again. Uh, and so later tonight, like a different tense fact will become true. The fact Ryan was talking to Warren, like that's going to become true at some point later tonight. And so the truth values of these tensed facts, they change over time. That's part of what it makes the dynamic theory dynamic. Uh, so, and then that's something that all the dynamic theories of time affirm. So an account of dynamic omniscience will need to affirm that tense facts change their truth value over time. And then an account of dynamic omniscience will also need to say that God's knowledge tracks the truth values of these facts over time. So if God's beliefs, if they're, if they're not tracking these changing truth values in the world, then God's just not going to be omniscient. But simply affirming this dynamic theory of time, I don't think this can be sufficient. Uh, and this is because the overwhelming majority of Thomists, Calvinists, Molinists, uh, and so on throughout history, they've all affirmed the dynamic theory of time. So someone like Sanders is going to have to like narrow down even more further like what he wants from this dynamic account of omniscience. And so for, for an open theist like Sanders, he says uh, that God created an open universe with a partially open future. And so what this means is that God has created a universe in which there are not many facts about what, uh, like about the future of the universe. And so there are not many facts about what will actually happen. There are all sorts of facts about what could possibly happen in the future. And God knows all of those. Um, and there are some facts about what will happen in the future on open theism and this dynamic account of omniscience. And God knows those, but there are not many facts about what will happen so you cannot say that God has exhaustive definite foreknowledge because of this. Mm, mm. Yeah, it, it, in, in my mind, I kind of see it as God, as that potter analogy at his mm. wheel, working to bring this to pass. It doesn't exist yet, but he's working to bring it to pass. And he knows what he wants to accomplish. And mm -hmm. he knows the clay that he's working with. And uh, and that's a, a kind of a crude analogy, but since the Bible uses it, I feel okay as, yeah, as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, you mentioned an open future. Um, what are the different meanings of an open future? Um, what do you think is is the most relevant to to Dio or, or dynamic omniscience? Yeah, so the the open theist Alan Rhoda, he's written some really good papers on what he calls the fivefold openness of the open future. So there's five different senses in which the future can be open. And so if anybody listening like wants to know more about this, check out Alan Rota's stuff because I'm just copying his homework here. So so like one meaning of the open future is just called epistemic openness. Uh, and so this means that you don't know what will in fact happen in the future. And that's a decent start, but that's not going to be enough for dynamic omniscience. So open theists like Sanders and Rota, they think there's a deeper explanation for why God cannot know what will happen in the future. And so one part of the explanation is that the future is ontically open. And ontically here just means like ontology or existence. 
And so the claim is that future events do not yet exist. Uh, the future has no ontology. It has no existence. But in, in my view, that's still not going to be enough because the overwhelming majority of classical theists throughout history have affirmed that the future is ontically open. And so in my first book, The End of the Timeless God, I argued that the majority view throughout church history about the Christian history is, has been presentism, which is a version of the, dyna the dynamic theory of time. So this is a temporal ontology that says only the present moment of time exists and past moments no longer exist and future moments do not yet exist. So just simply affirming an ontically open future, like that's not going to do much to really distinguish an open theist from a classical theist. And Sanders wants to do that. So and, that, and that's fine, though, because people like Alan Rhoda, they're going to try to argue from the ontic openness of the future to another sense of the open future. Uh, and so here's this other kind of meaning for the open future. It's called alethic openness. And alethic here, it, it just means truth. Uh, so like, like the truth value of a proposition. Is a proposition true or false or is it something else? Uh, and so this, I think, is really crucial for an account of dynamic omniscience. And so, so here's the big idea. So propositions about the future, they are said to be alethically settled if there is, like right now, a fact about what will happen in the future. So, for example, consider the statement, Ryan will go to Bible study after this video. The future is alethically settled if that proposition is, like right now, it's, it's true, uh, and it's completely fixed. And when I say fixed, I, I, I say that because like the proposition cannot possibly become false like just a few seconds from now. So here's uh, so that's the settledness. But you want to know about future because that's 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 what the open theist wants. So the future is going to be alethically open if propositions about the future are not completely fixed. And there are different ways for developing this idea. Uh, so for example, you might say that the proposition Ryan will go to Bible study after this video is neither true nor false. Uh, or you might say that the proposition is false right now, uh, but the proposition Ryan might go to the Bible study after this is true. So there's different accounts of how to develop like this kind of temporal logic for the future. Um, things get complicated, so I won't go into it, but that's because like just in general, temporal logic, it's really complicated and mm -hmm. I don't know how to explain it in a very simple way. Uh, but the big idea is that contingent propositions about what will happen in the future, they're not settled right now. Uh, and so, and I think that's what an account of dynamic omniscience needs to say. Yeah, uh, that, that that resonates with my own lay person understanding uh, is that things are developing, things are obtaining. Uh, to use a crude analogy, um, you know, whether or not a car will exist in 50 years at a particular point in time and careen over the edge is likely undetermined right now. But there comes a point when that car does exist and is headed towards that ravine and it reaches a point of no return. And you, you know that, it, that the truth proposition has reached and obtained that truthfulness that it mm -hmm. will go over the edge. So this idea that they are not... And, Alethically, this is, I'm going to improve my vocabulary thanks to your appearance right. tonight. Alethically, uh, I tend to think that they're neither true nor false yet. Um, I, I, I equate that in my own reasoning with this interplay of possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, anything with a probability of 100%, can I really call that possible? Or is it inevitable, certain, guaranteed? If it has a probability of 0%, can I really call that possible? It seems it seems like possible needs to have an opportunity to obtain or not to obtain. Mm. And, and in my view, I, I think that reality just seems to resonate. I mean, we can get into the scriptural support, but it just seems to connect that there is genuine possibility. So I appreciate you offering a highbrow uh, and well thought out <laughs> uh, explanation for my uh, hairy knuckled, uh, fumbling in the dark approach to arrive at, at something so articulate. Um, but for, for people that are, that are just tuning in or, or maybe that they, they struggle, uh, to follow, um, could you give us a, like a quick summary? I mean, can you, what, what is this nuanced account and what is it, what does it need to say? Just give us a, a, a just a, a summary if you don't mind. Yeah. So to summarize this account of dynamic omniscience, I think you need to say like basically three things. 
So first, you're going to say God is omniscient in the sense that God knows all of the facts, just knows all the facts. And then second, the dynamic theory of time, you're going to have to say that's true because there are tense facts that change their truth value over time. And then third, I guess this is the most important part. Uh, there is some moment in God's life where the future is going to be alethically open. And again, that just means that there is some moment in God's life where the truth values about future contingent propositions are not completely settled. So that's that's the summary. Mm, mm. Okay, thank you. Now, um, the, the thumbnail for this video <laughs> uh, raised a few eyebrows. Uh, dynamic omniscience for everyone. So I think I think now would be a good time to talk about um, our brothers that adhere to uh, Calvinism, Molinism. Um, you, you said you have an argument for why they should affirm dynamic omniscience. Um, many of our listeners find that terrifying and shocking and um, uh, controversial to say the least. So could you could you tell us how to get started on on that kind of argument? Yeah. So there are several things that the majority of Calvinists and Molinists have affirmed throughout throughout history that I think should push them to affirm this dynamic account of omniscience that I just summarized a second ago. So first, uh, Calvinists and Molinists, like Molinists, they agree that God is omniscient. Like, you know, everybody wants to say that. They're just going to disagree over which fa like facts exist in the world for God to know. Uh, now, second, so prior to Einstein, uh, like the overwhelming majority of Christian thinkers affirmed this dynamic theory of time. And, and in fact, when I go through all the different like scholastic textbooks and all this kind of stuff, um, like they even built this dynamic theory of time into their accounts of omniscience, predestination, providence. It's just all right in there. And then third, Calvinist and Molinists say that there is a moment in the life of God where these truth values about future contingent propositions are not completely settled. And so that's the part I really want to focus in on, because uh, that's the part that's probably going to shock a lot of people. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, uh, no doubt. I, I think your intuition there is is spot on. Um, why why should anyone think that Calvinists, Molinists, that they would affirm that there is um, this moment in God's life where the truth values about future contingent propositions uh, are not completely settled? So the main reason is to believe this is because that's just what Calvinists and Molinists say. Uh, so here's this like, like really dirty little secret that gets glossed over in most of the discussions of Calvinism and Molinism that I see today. So both views say that there is a logical moment in the life of God where God does not know the future. Uh, and so I should probably say something about logical moments. Then we can look at this distinction between what's called God's natural knowledge and God's free knowledge. So in the late Middle Ages, um, there's this Christian philosopher named John Duns Scotus uh, from, from like kind of Scotland. And so Scotus, he's not satisfied with these previous attempts to reconcile God's freedom with attributes like divine timelessness and immutability. And then he's also not satisfied with different attempts to reconcile human freedom and divine foreknowledge. So what he does is he introduces this concept of what he calls instance of nature or what we now typically call logical moments. And so logical moments, they function like temporal moments. Uh, so moments, they describe the way things are, but can be subsequently otherwise. And so like a moment is a when something happens. And then also moments can be successively ordered in earlier than and later than relations. And so what Scotus claims is that logical moments are just like this, but they can somehow all like magically happen within a single like timeless moment or even a single temporal moment because he gives examples of both. So Scotus wants to apply these logical moments to his account of divine and human freedom, divine providence, like just like all sorts of stuff because he thinks it can solve a, a bunch of problems in our theology. And what this does is this sets the stage for later debates between Thomists, Calvinists, Molinists, and, and all sorts of people even, even today. So what develops after SCOTUS is this distinction between God's natural knowledge and God's free knowledge. And then Molinists, they add something in between those two, uh, which is called middle knowledge. And that's not going to matter too much for today. Um, but here's the claim from everyone. There are multiple logical moments in the life of God. And at the first moment, there is God with his natural knowledge. And at the second moment, logical moment, there is God with his free knowledge and thus foreknowledge. And so you see this in a lot of different people. So here's a Calvinist uh, named Francis Turretin. So Turretin says that God's natural knowledge is of the things that are, quote, merely possible, whereas God's free knowledge is just, quote, knowledge of future things. 
uh, that God freely determined to bring about. And then uh, there's this other Calvinist uh, named Richard Baxter, and he gives a slightly different take on this because he uh, he posits three logical moments or what he calls instants in the life of God prior to creation. And, and this is actually like a really common thing uh, for Calvinists because the Calvinists are constantly debating over the exact number of logical moments in the life of God, even over like the, the order of them as well. And so you see this in debates over what's called infralapsarianism and superlapsarianism. But anyway, here's here's a direct quote from Baxter. So this is this is what exactly what Baxter says. So he says, God's intellect is relatively denominated omniscient in respect to three sorts of objects, also in three instants. One, in the first instant, he knoweth all possibles, knoweth, because whoever translated this was, you know, want to do some old English, I guess. So he knoweth all possibles in his own omnipotence. For to know things to be possible is but to know what he can do. Two, in the second instant, he knoweth all things as congruous, eligible, and volunda. Because you got to just throw in some untranslated Latin every now and then. That's that's what makes you really, uh, you know, like really smart. And that just uh, means uh, fit to be willed. And this is out of the perfection of his own wisdom, which is but to be perfectly wise and to know what perfect wisdom should offer as eligible to the will. And then three, in the third instant, he knoweth all things willed by him as such as volita, which is but to know his own will and so that they will be. In all of these instances, we suppose the things themselves not to have yet any being, but speak of gods related to imaginary beings according to the common speech of men. Okay, so let me break this down just a bit for us, because that's, you know, it's, it's, you're just hearing a quote yeah, from somebody. I mean, somebody's... you use some Latin there, so you're going to, you yeah. Know, for those for those watching that aren't as fluent as you and I are, if you yes. if you could simplify that for our viewers. <laughs> right, because we all we all know Latin, Latin perfectly well. I mean, just, right. yeah. Anyway, so, so, so let me see. Yeah. So what we're talking about here is like God existing all alone prior to the existence of the created universe. And that's the classical position of creation ex nihilo. That's what open theists today say about creation ex nihilo. So that's something everyone agrees on. Uh, there's this actual prior state of affairs where God exists all alone without any created thing. And then from there, what the Calvinists and the Molinists do is they start carving up God's life into distinct logical moments. And so I want people to notice something very important here. So at the moment of natural knowledge, God only knows what could happen if he were to create. So at this logical moment, God does not know what will happen because God does not even know if he himself will create anything at all. So as Calvinists like Terence Thiessen and Molinists like Thomas Flint, as they make very clear, at this logical moment, there are not even any true counterfactuals of divine freedom. And you might ask, why? Well, because the future is alethically open at the first logical moment of God's life. God has not yet determined to create at all nor has God determined that any particular timeline should come about. In other words, there is no fact of the matter about what God will do at the first logical moment of natural knowledge. So facts about what God will freely do are contingent facts and thus fall outside of the scope of natural knowledge, which only covers necessary facts. And that is, well, I mean, it's going to be shocking for people whose only knowledge of Calvinism is just the internet. So let's let's just dive a little bit deeper here. So let's look at that next logical moment, So, the, which is the one that was called God's free knowledge. Mm -hmm. So this is another point where Calvinists and Molinists, they're going to agree. So they say that after God decides to freely create a universe, then God gets this foreknowledge. So God's foreknowledge is dependent upon God's free decision to create a particular universe with a particular settled timeline. That's why it's called free knowledge. Uh, so here's what's happening. So at the moment of natural knowledge, there is no fact about what God will do. Will God create or not? Will he create this universe or maybe like a completely different universe? Maybe God will just say, I don't want to create anything at all. Like screw all of you. Like God does not know because there is no fact of the matter. Uh, but at the next logical moment, God makes a free decision to create. And then and only then does God get the free knowledge because he has determined the truth values about certain facts of the future. And so. This looks like dynamic omniscience because there is a moment in God's life where the truth values about future contingent propositions are not completely settled. And that is the moment of natural knowledge. And then however many you know moments you want to put in there before God reaches the moment of free knowledge. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I um I I, I might you might even describe these logical moments as God thinking, but well. Mm -hmm. We'll circle back around. Yeah, well, yeah, that, we'll I circle think. back into that. Um, 
stay tuned, uh, dear viewer. Um, can, can you, can, Ryan, can you give me um, an example of a Calvinist who, who explicitly says that God does not foreknow that he will create? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Um, so uh, one of my former teachers, uh, John Feinberg, um, so he's a Calvinist, and he wrote this very influential uh, uh, systematic theology textbook called uh, No One Like Him, The Doctrine of God. Uh, and so what I'm going to read here is from pages 313 through 314 of No One Like Him. And so in my opinion, I think like Feinberg is a really thorough, excellent defense of Calvinism. Uh, so if you're really interested in Calvinism or maybe you're on the fence, like, you know, this is a place to go. So this is from pages 313 to 314. So here's what Feinberg says. And I'm not going to do an impersonation of Feinberg because um, I, I just can't maintain it for more than a sentence. So we'll, we'll so, send you another shirt if you do. <laughs> no, 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 no. Sorry. Sorry, John. I won't do that. We'll do that. Uh, so but wouldn't God foreknow that he would create and foreknow which world it would be? As already stated, divine omniscience means nothing. Or I'm sorry. Divine omniscience means, among other things, that God only knows what can be known. Until God decided to create and chose to actualize a particular possible world, there was nothing to know about whether and what he would create. Does this mean that once God made the decision, he came to know something he had not known before? Yes. But this is only damaging to omniscience and immutability if what he came to know was information available before he came to know it. God could be aware of all the possibilities open to him in advance of choosing any of them, but until he decided to create a world and which one to create, he could not know whether he would create, and if he would, which possible world he would create. Although this response may seem strange, I think that it is the most plausible way to understand biblical language that says God decided to do one thing or another before the foundation of the world, and that he makes decisions not arbitrarily, but based on the counsel of his will. And so what Feinberg's there is he's trying to bank off of passages like uh, Ephesians 1, uh, where it talks about God making some kind of plan, making some sort of like deciding to do something before he creates the universe. Uh, and so that's that's what Feinberg says. Yeah. Now, um, I know this this has got to not sit too well right now with some some Calvinists and Molinists that are watching and, and they they're hearing that they really should be affirming dynamic omniscience or their systems presuppose or entail it. Um, they may say there's really no moment in the life of God where, where truth values of future contingent propositions uh, are not completely subtle. Um, you know, they'll say something like um, all of these logical moments are really just a single timeless thing we call a moment. So God never really faces an open future. What, what would you make of that? I I find this really just conceptually confused. I mean, it's a very common claim from classical theists. Like they'll often just try to push back and be like, whoa, hang on, Ryan. Like, you know, God timelessly knows everything. So there's no sense in which God actually faces an open future. Uh, I mean, you see this like in Tom Flint, who I mentioned before. Um, but again, I, I just I just think it's conceptually confused. And so and so here's why. So Tim O'Connor, he points out just how implausible all of this talk of logical moments in the life of a timeless God really is. It's implausible because it treats these logical moments as if they describe an open future when in fact there is no open future. And so when Scotus and all these Calvinists and Molinists, when they start telling us about these logical moments in the life of God, what they're trying to do is they're trying to give us a story about how God and humans have genuine freedom. They're trying to give us a story about how there's like real contingency in the world and how God's predestination is actually based on perfect divine reason and wisdom. And But here's the problem. The story of logical moments says that God faces an open future. And if God does not actually face an open future because God is timeless, then the story of logical moments does not actually preserve divine and human freedom, nor the rationality of predestination, nor any of these other things. So the story of logical moments becomes nothing more than a mere fiction. Here's another problem, though, that I have with it. So the story of logical moments, I think it's conceptually confused for another reason. So logical priority, it's supposed to be between compossible or what you call mutually consistent states of affairs. Let me give an example of this because that sounds like a mouthful of nonsense. Um, so so think of something like two plus two equals four. Like that's, that's, that's a nice easy one. We all know that one. So the two plus two, like that's logically prior to the equals four part. But like all of those mathematical entities, like they are compossible with each other. They can exist as a single like state of affairs. Like there's nothing inconsistent about them. And that's fine. You can talk about logical priority within things that are consistent like that. 
But this is not true when you start talking about incompatible states of affairs, like it is indeterminate if God will create, and it is determinate if th that God will create. I mean, those are just inconsistent states of affairs. Mm -hmm. God not knowing what he will do and God knowing what he will do. Those are inconsistent yeah. states of affairs. And so the story that Calvinists and Molinists that they give us, they're giving us an account of inconsistent states of affairs, which is fine. Um, but that's precisely what logical priority does not allow for. So that's the problem. Mm. I mean, I think I think that's entirely well reasoned and, and articulate and makes sense to me. I mean, I I see that. But uh, when you're when you say the story of, of logical moments is uh, is a fiction or it, it becomes a fiction, what, what do you what do you mean? So I want to say it's a fiction because the story does not actually apply to God like at all. And in, in which case, like Calvinists and Molinists, they've just been wasting our time with their entire theory of divine predestination and providence. So, and I can even give you examples of Calvinists who admit that these logical moments do not actually apply to God. So there's this French Calvinist named Moses Amarant. He gets in a, he gets in a bit of trouble because he lays out an order of logical moments that looks like what the Arminians believe. And so he gets pushed on this and he goes, oh, well, that, like, look, these don't apply to God. These are just, you know, it's just a useful fiction in my head to, to do theology. Uh, Louis Burkhoff, he does the same thing when he's talking about debates between infralapsarians and superlapsarians. He's like, well, you know, these are don't really apply to God. It's just useful ways of trying to order our theology. And then contemporary uh, Calvinists like Paul Helm uh, and James Dozel, um, like Paul Helm, he just doesn't like the idea at all. He just thinks. He's like, at best, it's going to help you with your systematic theology, get it kind of in some sort of order, but he would just prefer we stay away from it. And then James Dozel, he's really explicit. He says, when we're looking at the simple God from this doctrine of divine simplicity, there cannot be logical moments or logical distinctions within, they can't apply to the life of a simple God. Uh, so so what, the, what, what you see here from people like this, though, is they'll say they don't apply to God, so it's fiction, but they'll still say it's a useful way of talking in order to do systematic theology. But I, I just completely disagree with this. Like if these logical moments, if they don't apply to God, they're not going to be useful for systematic theology. Uh, like fictions like these, they're going to be useless for theology because fictions do not remove real theological problems. Because remember, the whole reason SCOTUS and everyone else introduced these logical moments was to remove particular puzzles and problems that theology faced. And if you go, well, yes, I've got a way to like, you know, solve all your problems for you. Let me tell you a false story about the world. And you're going to go, thank you, but I've got a real problem and I need a real story. Like, you know, I, you know what, what are you giving these false stories for? So I think it's gonna be a waste of time if you go with this whole like fiction account. But there are other uh, Calvinists and Molinists who don't want to do that. Like they want to go, I want to give you a realist account of these logical moments in the life of God. Uh, so people like Richard Mueller, who's um, a really big uh, uh, scholar of like the reformed uh, scholastic era. He says, like, we got to be realist about these. Uh, and then Terrence uh, Thiessen, who I mentioned earlier, um, he also wants to be a realist about these. He thinks that he disagrees with Paul Helm entirely. He says, like, no, these got to be real aspects of, of God's life. But here's the thing. Um, so I think if the Calvinists and the Molinists, if they want to be realist about these moments of natural knowledge and the moments of free knowledge, I think they're going to have to say something else. I think they're going to need to say that these are actual incompatible states of affairs and they're going to have to be actual moments in the life of God. Uh, they're going to have to be like actual temporal moments in the life of God. Because otherwise I just can't, I can't like make coherent sense of this. Now, if they say that, if they make God temporal, then I think both Calvinist and Molinist can coherently talk about God facing an open future prior to creation. And that's exactly what that Calvinist John Feinberg, uh, who I mentioned earlier, who I quoted from earlier. I mean, he's, he affirms divine temporality. Uh, Terrence Thiessen, he wants to avoid uh, divine temporality, but he admits that he just he can't really make sense of all this talk about God being timeless. And if I remember correctly, um, there's some other theological determinists who want to affirm divine temporality. So Jesse Cohen Hoven, if I remember correctly, I think he affirms divine temporality. Uh, and then the theological determinist, uh, Dirk Paraboom, if I remember correctly, he does too, uh, but I might be mistaken about Dirk. Um, Brian Pitts is another theological determinist, and he definitely affirms a theory, dynamic theory of time I mean, uh, and divine temporality. And then for me personally, I'm like, I strongly am attracted to, uh, to Molinism. And I think that divine temporality, I think it's just the way forward for the Molinist to solve at least some puzzles about, uh, about theology. 
Um, so I think you just got to dispense with the logical moments and then just start talking about actual temporal moments. I think that's the way forward. Mm. It, it, it sounds like it sounds like all of these camps, for the most part, began with an open premise mm -hmm. and then encountered various, let's just say, concerns that they sought to address um, and created various answers that they thought would accomplish that. And then later would have to go back and remove those in order to address later developments or impediments. And so it really seems like everyone begins with this, I should say everyone, most people, Calvinists, Molinists, and open theists, we, we begin with this open premise of a thinking, reasoned, wise God. Mm -hmm. um, and then we all, it's like herding kittens, you know, one, one goes this way, one goes yeah. that way, one goes this way. Uh, and then we all call each other heretics and, and try and kick each other out of the kingdom. Um, you know, it's that brotherly love, you know? Yeah. <laughs> How dare you affirm what we affirm, but not affirm these other things we affirm. Um, you know, but it, it, it is, a, it's a very fascinating topic. And, um, you know, there's this, it's almost like two lanes. You have the biblical justification and arguments for these various views. And then you have the philosophical, let's take those and, and try and develop those and see where they go. And, and those are usually tracking, you know, pretty, and I think in a healthy system, they're going to, they're going to parallel. Um, and sometimes we get a little out of, out of balance, but um, I, I, I would, is there, is there any, is there any um, strong argument, let's say from a biblical basis for rejecting this idea that God possesses dynamic omniscience? What would be the strong biblical argument for those that just have a real hard time with this idea of a reasoned thinking, actively loving creator that, you know, and I don't want, I don't want to be polemic in the way that I'm, sure. I'm yeah. dealing with it. And, and it, part of me, part of me naturally goes that route. So I'm trying to bridle that. I'm trying to bridle yeah. that. And I've got a lot of dear Calvinists and Molinists uh, watching. So what would be a good biblical or where, where, where would they go with this, Ryan, to, to get rid of a, this thinking I, God. I would I would struggle to to figure out how to, how they could argue this because when I look at the majority view throughout Western tradition, not just in Christianity but also Islam and Judaism, hardly anybody wants to deny that God is perfectly rational and that God is not a thinking thing. I mean, the overwhelming majority just want to go. God has life. He has thought. He has beliefs. There's this huge doctrine called the doctrine of divine ideas. That's that's a major th uh, theme throughout the entire Western tradition. Uh, that God has these like these actual mental representations of all the possibilities, and God uses that as the basis for determining what kind of universe to create. I just don't, if you want to get rid of like thinking and rationality from God, I, I just don't know what you're going to do. Um, mm -hmm. What you'd have to do is you'd have to take all the biblical passages that talk about uh, God planning, uh, using His wisdom, um, acting according to His reasons and wisdom, basically everything throughout. Uh, most of the Old Testament descriptions of God and then passages like Ephesians 1 and all this, you're going to have to take all those and, and really play this anthropomorphic card, say like, that's just a human way of talking and nothing more. I think you're going to have to end up explaining a lot of scripture away. Uh, and so I, I just, yeah, I don't, I can't think of a good biblical argument for doing that though. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I think that's, that's where I struggle to answer this question very, very well, um, because I just think there's too much a affirmation of divine rationality throughout the entire Western tradition, regardless of what you want to say about other things about God. That's just such a huge, huge view. Yeah. I, um, it, it's good to know that I'm not alone in struggling with that, that idea yeah. of dismissing it all as analogical, because at some mm -hmm. point I, I want to say, well, then if God is revealing himself, but he's revealing himself in a way that has no direct, let's say direct analog that we could actually understand. It's a, it's a, it's, um, analogical and, and without any sort of it's transcendent we don't know what it's an analog for but that, that doesn't seem really to accomplish the the point of scripture it seems like he's no. trying to make himself known and yeah you know. yeah if, um, if, if your goal is to reveal yourself to creatures in order to become friends with them which i think is what the gospel of john is kind of getting at uh you don't do a very good job at revealing yourself by talking in terms that describe you in the exact opposite ways that you're like so i i just you know, like, I, I just think it's not a good strategy. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, now I've got I've got a couple other questions here. Mm -hmm. um, we're coming up at the forty five minute mark here, and I want to be respectful of your time. And I'd also like to be able to get in some some audience uh, audience questions. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've talked about um, this idea of divine temporality for knowing, you know, to know before, predestining, to know, like to destine before. It, it, it seems like so much of the, both the Calvinist and the Molinist language there assumes and operates on this idea of God being temporal or, or at least um, sequential. When, when we talk about temporality, it seems like th those camps, not all of them, but many in that camp will take divine temporality and they think that it's a box that God created and then steps in two. But even if that were a correct depiction of God creating time, it, and I was talking about this with a brother online earlier, that act presupposes temporality for God to create that box yeah. to enter into because we're talking about sequence. So could you walk us through kind of a healthy definition of how you understand time and why we believe God is truly sequential? Yeah. So when we're, what everybody agrees in these debates is that God is an eternal being, which means that God exists without beginning and without end. Um, but when you want to say God's timeless, then you're going to say God also exists without succession, without temporal location. So God's not going to do one thing or another, and he's not located right now or earlier or later, nothing like that. If you want to say God's temporal, you go, God exists without beginning, without end, because he's an eternal being. But you're going to say God can have temporal location and God can have succession. So God can exist right now uh, and God can do one thing and then another and then another. Um, and when it comes to time, you could say time is not really a thing. It's just like a relationship between events. So it's just and there's all sorts of weird ways you could talk in order to establish that there's a before and after. Mm -hmm. So if, so again, going back to your analogy of like, what if time's like this box and that God steps into? It seems like you're talking about God without the box and then God with the box. So there's a before and after. So it's like, ooh, you got time in there. Uh, and so that's what the relational theory is going to be like, yeah, yeah, you're always going to have like this kind of before and after relations or something. Now, the box view, though, uh, this is what's called the absolute theory or the substantivalist view. Um, and this says that time is actually like a thing, like it's this substance. It's an eternal substance. Uh, and some will say it's an eternal uncaused substance. And what it does is it, it, time has certain functions that it plays, the so, certain roles that it takes on, which is to explain um, why change is possible, it explains like the source of moments, and explains like why there's a particular series of moments. And there's different views about that. So some people uh, in the Eastern and Western traditions will say that God creates this absolute theory of uh, this absolute time. Some others will go time and God just as just two uh, of a whole bunch of other eternal uncaused substances that exist. There's maybe there's a bunch of other eternal uncaused substances that exist and God just, you know, uses, creates some stuff to place it in time. Uh, and then there's another strong view within, again, Eastern and Western traditions that says, I don't need all these eternal uncaused substances just kind of floating around because uh, God is an eternal uncaused substance. So God can take on all these roles. Uh, so God is time or time is like an attribute of God. And so you see this in Isaac Newton uh, in the West. You see this in someone named Raghunata Shiromani in uh, the Hindu tradition. So there's there's different people who affirm um, these these different kind of combinations of views. And it's, it's, it's very fascinating. And, and, and I love... I love that we're talking about uh, this particular topic tonight because um, I, I see dynamic omniscience as a potential bridge between these various camps of uh, the Calvinist and their, their form of determinism, the Molinist, the open theist. I see all of them being able to uh, operate and, and assuming at the very least a simple or a, um, a mere dynamic omniscience. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, it, it, in the online forums and the debates, the argument, like you said, I, I think at the top is that this means that God is ignorant, but no one in, in, is arguing that, that God is ignorant. We're all trying to figure out, you know, really how God knows. And uh, if God has created an active and energetic reality, a world, then it seems to make sense that he would know it actively and 
energetically, mm -hmm. you know it as it, as it is. And so I see this as, as a really good bridge builder. Um, now I'm looking here through my notes, seeing if I, I want to make sure that I don't leave anything on the table while I've got you here. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Do, do you see any potential? And, and this, this, this may, you may not have, have uh, too much to say on this regard, but do you see any sort of potential benefit for like Christian apologetics when um, presented with a, a thinking and reason to God? Yeah. So one of the, one of the edges that theism is supposed to have over atheism, for example, is that the universe exists for a reason or for a purpose. And, and if you want to affirm that God is perfectly rational, you're going to say God creates the universe for a reason. And that's why the universe has purpose, has some kind of value uh, in the sense of having a purpose or a reason for why it exists. If, if you lost that, well, then I don't see what the difference would be in terms of the value of the universe between theism and atheism in this one respect, which is if, if you're a theist, it seems like you can argue the universe exists for a reason and has some kind of purpose. Uh, whereas you, if you're an atheist, it's going to be really hard to establish that the universe exists for a reason or for a purpose. Hmm. Um, but if you want to go, well, God doesn't actually act for reasons, doesn't have reason because he's like so beyond, you know, all these things. Then I'm going to be like, I don't, I lost this edge over atheism because it seems like if God doesn't have rationality, doesn't have uh, reasons for acting, then the universe doesn't exist for a reason. It couldn't exist for a reason. Uh, and then I'd be like, well, the atheist says that too. What's the difference between me and an atheist now? Uh, and also if I have to go with all this beyond language, um, and I'm saying God's just beyond everything. He's even beyond existence. Uh, well, the atheist is going to be happy to say that too. Be like, yeah, that's right. God's beyond existence, you know, doesn't <laughs> exist. So yeah, so if I start going down this road, I lose, I think, any difference between me and an atheist. Uh, whereas if I start affirming these kinds of things and go, yeah, I do affirm that God is a rational being, then I think I get one edge over atheism, which is the universe exists for a reason. Mm -hmm. Now, I um, am a small channel here at Idol Killer, and uh, I do not have anyone starring these questions. So mm -hmm. um, for those of you guys that have been watching, tuning in, if you've asked questions, I've been oblivious to them all. I've been interacting with uh, with Ryan here. So if you have a question for him, please go ahead, uh, put in bold in the in the uh, the chat there the word question, and then state your question, and uh, and we'll try and get some of these uh, to Ryan. I want to make sure that again we're respectful of his time. But if you're watching and you have a question, just put in bold question, type it out. We'll throw it on the screen and. Um, Hopefully, uh, uh, Ryan can tell you why you need to affirm dynamic omniscience and answer your question here. Um, so, uh, Ryan, uh, I see you're wearing mm -hmm. a very lovely uh, shirt there. What, 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 do we, what do we have here? So we've got, let me see, back this up a little bit. So I'm pretty sure this is, this is John Calvin that you put a, put an X, so made a skull of, um, but yes, this is one of the idol, idol killers t-shirts that you sent me. So this is very lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I I I I uh, I like to pick on my my Calvinist brothers. I I, I spent about thirty years uh, in that tradition, and eventually I plan on moving uh, and, and and ticking off everyone uh, equally. Uh, the the whole point of that shirt was not uh, just to pick on Calvin, but to say, hey, look, Christ is the one who is living and resurrected, and like let's really try and focus on the sure foundation. And we have a lot of well intended and not so well intended men giving us their opinions and hey they're all they can all help they can show us the right way or the wrong way but at the end of the day Christ is the truth and so this was um, uh, my attempt at that sort of imagery not yeah. to uh, tick anyone off but, but, but I think I think Calvin would appreciate it though because Calvin would be the last person to say please idolize me I mean he would hate that he'd be like oh, yeah. oh worm that I am you should not you should not idolize me so I think he would appreciate this. I think I think I think so. I, I even even as, as someone who is uh, no longer a Calvinist, I, I think that were he here and I was able to speak French uh, as fluently as I speak Latin mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and I could convey this to him, I, I think he'd get a kick out of it. Um, so here we've got a question from Michael Faber. He says, what alterations to Calvinism or Molinism would have to take place to embrace dynamic omniscience? Mm hmm. Yeah, so that's a good because uh, I don't think I stated it very well earlier. So it'd be really so the simple alterations I would think are this. 
Um, one, you would say God's temporal. So God exists without beginning, without end, but does have succession in his life. Uh, and that wouldn't really be affecting Calvinism or Molinism. This is just your doctrine of God that you've got underneath um, that you're going to be building Calvinism and Molinism on top of. So you'd be saying there is a moment prior to creation where God's not decided, abs he's not decided anything, doesn't even know if he's going to create. Well, you've already got that uh, if you're a Calvinist and a Molinist. You're just going to say it's a temporal moment instead of a logical moment. And then you're going to say branching from this, this moment prior to creation are all possible timelines, uh, all the possible things that God could bring about at the next moment. And if you're a Calvinist or a Molinist, you're going to have a story to tell about what reasons God uses to select one of those potential timelines that branches from this initial state of the universe, or this initial state of uh, reality, not the universe, because the universe doesn't exist yet. Um, so that's, that's, that's basically the alteration is just to go affirm God's temporal. These are real moments. They're actual moments. And then the rest of the story of Calvinism and Molinism just falls into place. Mm -hmm. So basically just say, Hey, God operates sequentially. Yep, mm -hmm. there you yeah. Go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now we got a question here from Random Theology. Will necessarianism be a solution? Um, it depends what you want. So if you want to affirm the kind of divine freedom that Calvinist and Molinist do, then this is not going to be an option. Um, so necessitarianism is going to be the view that like everything is necessary uh, and there's no um, contingency in the world. All the stuff about the logical moments that I was talking about earlier, that was designed specifically to avoid necessitarianism. Mm. If you don't care about that, if you're just like, yeah, everything's necessary. There's no contingency. Not even God has anything contingent about him. Um, so like Avicenna does this, uh, then yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can just be like, that's fine. No big deal. I reject Calvinism. I reject Molinism. I reject all those things. Everything's necessary. Hmm. Yeah. That's, I mean, those are options. I, I, it's not an option I want to take, but that's an option. Yeah. It's, it seems like, it seems like the eternal bullet. It was never fired. It's just always been on target. Yeah. Um, it's just, it seems to lack a mind. Um, and that's now, actually the objection to Avicenna from Al-Ghazali is to go, no, uh, no rational being functions like that. Uh, Avicenna disagrees, but that is a big part of uh, the debate within Islamic thought to go is if God actually is a rational being, this is not the way to go. Hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, Mind Trap asks, in regards to objections about God and time, uh, as a box, wouldn't that thought process apply to space as well? Uh, not necessarily. You could do that if you want. Um, if you really think that Minkowski's uh, um, mathematical equations to make space and time the same thing, if you think that really applies to reality, then you might do that. Um, but since Minkowski's calculations to make this mathematical entity that we call space time, since those were idealized and intentionally ignored certain features of space and time, certain differences between them. Um, I don't think it's a good reason to affirm that space and time would both have to be a box, mm. but, but yeah, but, but there's a lot of people who do think that uh, I just, I, I just can't, I just can't follow. Now um, someone just noted here that we've had a few super chats, which oh, right. yeah, we've got to get those great and uh, highly appreciated. Uh, so thank you to whoever pointed that out as well. Uh, Bobby Whitley says, is time travel possible or does the future not exist until the present? Uh, so I want to say time travel is not possible because I, th well, okay. The exciting version of time travel is not possible because here's an account of time travel that's, that's totally possible. So the present is a moment that exists. And then Doctor Who could appear in your living room and he could be like, come, 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 I'll take you uh, into some different places uh, within some different moments in time. And you hop in uh, and then he counts down from 10 and then he opens the door. And like, he's not taken anywhere. He's not gone anywhere. You just open the door like 10 seconds later and you're like, you traveled through time. You know, yeah. I mean, that's not, I mean, that's not, that's not going to be interesting. You're not going to be, you're going to be pretty, you're going to probably be pretty annoyed with We're that. all time travelers in that regard. Yeah, you know? exactly. That's not exciting. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to be pretty mad at the doctor for doing that. Um, the exciting kind of time travel is where you could really travel to like distant events in the future or distant events in the past or something like that. And if presentism is true, uh, those moments they don't exist. There's nothing, there's no past to go back to mm. and there's no future to go to. Um, so I don't think time travel is possible uh, because I think presentism is true. Uh, yeah. Excellent. And I am, uh, I'm listening in one ear and I'm skimming the, uh, the question, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, with yeah. The, uh, the, the other here. Um, okay. So, uh, Did you had a few super chats, right? 
Well, I saw one. I saw the one. I scrolled okay, through. Right. If I missed one, somebody please point it out to me and I'll, I'll circle back. Um, Salvation Damnation uh, compliments the shirt, as yes. does uh, Victory Street Ministry. Thank you, guys. Uh, it's the model. It's really, it's the model, you know, that's we, we bring on the attractive people to sell the merchandise because um, uh, if I put it on, I would get a lot of returns. Um, okay, so uh, Jesus Christ is the one true God asks... When would you say that God begins to know specific things? For example, when does God know someone will put their faith in him? Mm. Okay, so that's going to depend on the theory of providence you're going to affirm. So if you're going to be a Calvinist or a Molinist, what you're going to be saying is uh, after God decides which specific timeline to create, certain truths uh, um, or certain propositions get us a determinate truth value of true or false. So after the moment of natural knowledge when god just freely decides this is the universe i want in this particular timeline that's the one i want then god knows uh it will be the case at this particular time that you know uh that, that jessica is going to uh, accept jesus uh, as her lord and savior um if you're an open theist then you're gonna go and it comes a lot later um it's gonna be much further down the line where god's gonna go I'm pretty sure I can get Jessica to accept Jesus. Uh, there's a there's an objective probability of you know ninety percent, eighty percent, whatever. If they've got all these options for how to how to make that happen, uh, and God's going to try to maneuver things towards the 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 way that'll really raise the probability quite high. And it might be that at some point, um, as it gets closer and closer to the event, the probability would go up and up and up. Uh, that that like that'll be like almost certain that God will eventually bring Jessica to a saving faith. Um, so it, it's going to depend on the other details of providence that you're going to have, how you're going to answer that question. But it's a good question, though. Thank you for that. Um, and then Japheth uh, says, complete present and past knowledge without exhaustive future knowledge. I deny the concept of knowing all possibilities. Is my position still? Can it still be called do? So he's uh, I, recognizing complete yeah. present and past knowledge without exhaustive future knowledge. And he denies the concept of knowing all possibilities. So I think essentially he's trying to say possibilities themselves obtain a truth value as to whether or not they're even possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess you could still say it's a version of dynamic omniscience. So you'd just be narrowing the scope a little bit more to go. It's not simply that there's just some moment where God faces an open future, but uh, you know, he's constantly facing a good open future. Um, so that's what most open theists want to say. But typically open theists want to go, yeah, but God always knows all the possibilities because that's the initial starting point uh, is before God even decides to create anything, he already knows all the possibilities because all the possibilities are necessarily true. Mm. Um, if you say certain possibilities are only contingently true, I start to lose my grasp on what that means uh, because in order to be possible uh, at some point in the future it already has to be possible full stop so yeah and i also would don't know why god wouldn't know all the possibilities um there might be an argument for why that's the case i just don't know what it is now this seems similar to the necessary uh, question mm -hmm. but can't the classical theist simply bite the bullet of a modal collapse and get out of dynamic omniscience they can, but they can't be a classical theist anymore. Uh, here's why. So classical theists are very explicit that they affirm that God has the ability to create or not create. God is free to create or not create. Uh, and God is free to create a completely different universe than this one. So if you bite the bullet and go with this like modal collapse where everything's necessary, you're giving up the classical understanding of divine freedom. Uh, and what you end up with is something that looks like the panentheist account of god in the universe so you'd just be giving up classical theism which again that's fine if you want to do that um but you'd be adopting panentheism uh, mm -hmm. which might not be that big of a deal some people don't like that so like when i push Catherine rogers on this she's like no, no no i want to be a classical theist i don't want to be a panentheist and i'm like but your view looks so much like it and she's like mm, shush shush so <laughs> so yeah 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 no that, that that's that's funny um and then uh connor says uh are you saying that god actually thinks Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a deeply traditional view. And I also find it really plausible as well. I don't know why I would deny it. Um, so again, throughout the entire Western tradition, and again, also in the Eastern tradition, so not just Christianity, the overwhelming majority view is that 
God is a is a being with perfect knowledge, perfect understanding, like what you call maximal cognitive excellence. Mm. So all the things that uh, are that make cognition uh, perfect, God's got that. So God has beliefs and He knows things, but not simply like just doesn't get lucky. Uh, he knows them in the in the best way, so He's not getting lucky. He knows them for the right reasons, and then God acts on the basis of the right reasons. He always acts on the basis of objectively. Uh, best reasons. Uh, if there aren't any uh, best acts to perform, then God's going to perform a objectively good act based on objectively good reasons. I mean, this is just, again, the entire uh, tradition of Western philosophical theology that that says this. And I just find it very plausible. I don't, I don't know why I would want to deny it. Yeah. Um, now, I have not paid Scott to say this. I don't know if you've been sending mm -hmm. bribes out to ask these sort of questions. Uh, but how does the audience take one of your online classes? Okay, so um, there's a couple options here. So one is an online class with uh, the University of Lucerne, um, which is in Switzerland. And so what you'll need to do is you'll need to contact the people there. So contact either David Anzalone uh, or uh, Vintimiglia. Uh, I forget what Vintimiglia's last name is. I think it's Conti. Um, uh, my wife's telling me that's not his last name at all. Um, so contact David Anzalone uh, or just email them directly through their through their website and you can sign up for the uh, God, Freedom and Evil course that I'll be doing. Um, then if you want to do it in person, I'm, then you'll want to contact Paul Gould at Palm Beach Atlantic University in Florida uh, because I'll be doing a class there uh, this January called God, Freedom or sorry, uh, God, Time and Creation, which is going to go through a lot of the stuff we did today in a lot more detail. Yeah. And, and I, I would be remiss, I have not yet plugged your podcast, The Reluctant mm. Theologian. Um, that's a great source. Uh, I will endorse it. I'm sorry that I'm going to detract uh, from the program with my endorsement. But I, I love The uh, Reluctant Theologian podcast. I think everybody should go check it out. Some very interesting conversations and topics are explored over there. Um, and uh, definitely go check that out. Now, W. Scott Taylor says, what value does dynamic, that that clarification for omniscience really give us isn't omniscience properly defined enough I, I i've been thinking about this for a while because i i think i could be persuaded that dynamics not really adding anything um because if you look at the if the definition of omniscience which is just that god knows all the facts of reality and then you go okay well what facts are there um then, then I just start. The, the debates will start just come boiling down to everything we talked about today. Uh, did God create a Calvinist universe where all the facts about the future are determined by, like, causally determined? Okay, well, those are the facts. Did God create a Molinist universe where all the facts about the future are not causally determined? They're, but they're still like, there's a ter determinate truth value. Like the, the truth values are settled. Okay, um, there you go. God knows all those. Or did God create an open universe where the future is like completely alethically open? Well, those are all the facts there are to know if God creates a universe like that. So it's not clear to me what dynamics really adding, um, but that might be because I'm just so deeply committed to certain understandings of time being dynamic that you could deny dynamic theory of time. And I want to go, that's just not time anymore. Or it gets these crazy results. Um, so I guess, okay. I guess to answer like the, as clearly as possible is to go, if you're persuaded like me that the dynamic theory of time is just has to be true, like there's no other way to go, then I don't need this dynamic qualifier to omniscience. If you are not persuaded, then the dynamic qualifier is actually doing work for you. I, th I think that's the best way to answer at the moment. And it seems, it, it, for me anyway, it seems to help draw a contrast between the underlying presuppositions of what we mean by omniscience. Is it... Yes static and, and eternally settled and unmoving or is it active and um and so I, I see that as a helpful tool in order to clarify our speech so that the other party knows what we mean because we're approaching omniscience with some some presuppositional baggage um but at the end of the day if dynamic omniscience is biblical omniscience all we're doing is we're using these terms to make it understandable for those who, who are struggling with it. Um, so here's a question from Cooper Craig. How does prophecy like Peter's three times denial work with a thinking God like in dynamic omniscience? How does that work? 
Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming it means like if I just go full blown open theist, how does that work? Uh, so not simply well, that. Probably, I, yeah, I'm yeah. assuming. I'm assuming he's assuming Dio as a as a full on open position. Yeah. So if you're an open theist, you've got a few different options. One is to say um, you could go. Well, God knows that Peter's going to deny Christ three times because God's causally determined that that's going to happen. Because open theists say that sometimes God might do that, uh, and He might need to do that in order to make sure things go according to plan. Um, if you don't like that, that's okay. There's some other options. Another option to go is to go. God's got this insane predictive ability. I mean, it is because like humans, you're not special snowflakes. I'm sorry. You're like, you're not that special. You are very predictable. Uh, that's why we're able to create all these AIs that can predict all your behavior and come up with these targeted advertising. God is even more impressive in his predictive power than that. So God could look at Peter and go, yeah, at this moment, I know the objective probability of you denying Christ three times tomorrow. I know it's like a 0.9 uh, it's, it's, uh, or like a 90%, you know, or even higher. Like that, that, that seems like an open theist could say that. Um, I guess you could also just go, God just took a shot in the dark and he got lucky. Mm. I, I would advise that one, um, but you could. I mean, I guess you could say that if you want. Yeah, and I think even in an open position, you would say that that God knew the character and heart mm -hmm. and and all of that uh, of Peter, and um, also knew the coming circumstances. Yeah. Um, now, uh, John Q here gives us another controversial statement. He says it just makes perfect sense. Um, you know, I I agree, yeah. um, and um, I, I think I think that what we're talking about here are. Uh, competing views of, of God is, is God living and active or, or static. And I think that how you arrive at your understanding of God is going to determine whether you go, oh, dynamic omniscience. Now I have a name for that thing I've always believed. Or you go, oh my gosh, get the, uh, the pitchforks and torches. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've got we've to persecute these guys that think God, God is reasoned and thinking. And But I, as you said, it, it seems like pretty much the entire uh, history of Christianity presupposes and operates on a thinking and reasoned God. Yeah. Um, and I think that on, on this mirror level of, of dynamic omniscience, I think you've done a very good job of explaining why everyone should uh, affirm it and how many Calvinists, Molinists, and open theists do. Um, now, does anybody else have any other questions here for, uh, for our guests before we let him go? Because once we let him go, this 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 man is a jet setter. He's a global uh, a global phenomenon, and we may never get him back here. Um, and so, I want to take advantage of this of this uh, resource that we have while while he's available. So make sure you're getting your questions in. And uh, and Ryan, just to give you an opportunity mm -hmm. here, um, we've touched on a vast array of related topics. Is there anything that you feel like you want to go back and hammer down a point you just really want to get across or a clarification? Um, yeah, so I guess to pick up on the point of divine rationality, so one of, so I'm working on three different book manuscripts at the moment. Uh, one is called A Little Book About a Big God. So the goal I set for myself is to lay out my own understanding of God within a hundred pages or less. And I love the title, by the way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm already, I'm already, I'm on an Amazon wish list that. <laughs> yeah. So was, yeah, I just got to finish it. I'm only like 75% done with the book. Um, but I've got a whole section in one of the chapters on why, like what all hangs on this claim that God acts for reasons. Uh, and so some of the stuff I highlight is that the entire, entire idea of what it means to be a free being, to have free will is, is that you act intentionally for a reason in order to bring in a particular goal. Uh, and then on the basis of this, the entire doctrine of creation, doctrines of providence, salvation, the incarnation, all of these things hang on this notion of perfect rationality. Uh, and, and theologians throughout history have debated this, like why, uh, why did the son become incarnate instead of the father or the Holy Spirit? Uh, why did God become incarnate at all? Uh, and then as it relates to like atonement, you'd be like, well, it seems like there's a lot of ways God could have brought out atonement. Why did he do it the way that he did? And these are all huge debates in Christian thought. And everybody always wants to go for this reason or for this reason or for this other reason. Um, so everybody's assuming that God's God's working from reasons because otherwise you have to go, why did God create the universe? Well, for no reason. Okay. Why did he permit all this horrible stuff to happen? Mm, no reason. 
Uh, why did God uh, save us? No reason. Why didn't he save us this other way? No reason. You just keep saying no reason. Mm. Yeah. I, 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 that, that's a really weird theology. Um, I just think that's crazy. It's just crazy. Mm. We've got one more here from Bobby Whitley. He says, do you think the dynamic uh, omniscience view shows that God is not the author of evil? Mm, that's a really good question. And this is one that I'm starting to try to toy around with in um, my little book about a big God. And that I'll be looking at in more detail in that class at the University of Lucerne on God, freedom and evil. Uh, the long story short is, if it helps, I don't think it's going to help much. Because a lot of the distinctions that open theists want to make um, about God permitting certain things for a reason, God allowing certain evils for a reason, God didn't intend this to come about, um, for, uh, didn't intend evil and, and so on. That's the same stuff that Molinists and Calvinists say. You can make an argument that Calvinists and Molinists cannot consistently say those things. Um, but here's something I, I do know for a fact that I can I give you direct quotes from open theists making these claims. Um, so the following claim. So Richard Swinburne, uh, John Hick, and Keith Ward, they're all open theists. And they all say that when God creates a universe, he knows that evil and suffering are inevitable. Mm. And they've got a reasons for why that's the case. It's part of their soul making theodicies and all this kind of stuff. And I like those a lot, but that's not going to really help you get a, a leg up on like a Molinist or a Calvinist. Cause they're going to, they're going to be able to say very similar kinds of things. Um, so I think if you want to go open theist, you, you might have lots of other reasons for doing that. I think there's some strong reasons for doing that. I don't think evil is going to be the best one though. Mm. Mm. Well, not if, not if you're saying that he knew it was inevitable. Right. If you, if you keep it within the realm of a possibility that may obtain, yeah, uh, I think that would give you some that would leg yeah. up on the other views. But but absolutely, if you're taking, I think you said Swinburne took his, that approach. Yeah, and it's William not, not going to help a whole lot there. Yeah. So the best uh, theodicies that I'm aware of in general uh, are from people like Swinburne and John Hick, and and uh, I really like William Hasker's theodicy a lot, but. Mm -hmm. They're all saying, yeah, God created this particular kind of universe where the probability of some kind of evil and suffering happening is just, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, and, and when you're, when you're uh, intellectualizing the problem of evil. Sure. And you're not living it or facing yes. it. Yeah. It's a lot easier to explain away or, or rationalize. But for those who have their foot in the bear trap. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, well, let me tell you why yeah. you're suffering right now. Um, you know, so so I don't I don't know if I would say that this has um, tremendous value in like Christian counseling, for example. Um, you know, you don't want to come in and meet somebody who's suffering and try and explain it away. I, I think that there are entire um, professions dealing with how to connect that. But if we're talking about it in a intellectual way that we're kind of detached. Um, I think the, the, my fear is that we get too detached from that real world <laughs> oh, yeah. application. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's a very good question. So thank you, Bobby, for, mm -hmm. for asking. Um, now here's, here's a related question. I mean, we're talking about Calvinists, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about Molinists. We're talking about those heretical open theists. And so you're all fair game on tonight's show guys. And, uh, and Jordan asked this question. He says, what is your best evidence for the Molinist view? If it's relevant enough to ask that here. And I'm asking, mm -hmm. Jordan, oh, yeah. I'm saying it's relevant. So yeah. I want to hear, I want to hear Ryan's answer. Yeah. So the short answer is, um, so if you read John Peckham's recent book on the divine attributes, I think he gives a, a really strong biblical case for, uh, God having foreknowledge. Um, it's not airtight, but I think it's really strong. Now, in light of that, then I have to go, okay, I, I think it's really obvious that, that creatures have free will. Uh, and I don't find compatibilist uh, stories about freedom being compatible with determinism. I don't find those very plausible, so I can't be a Calvinist anymore. Um, okay, well, so what are my options then in terms of giving an, a theory of providence that affirms libertarianism for human freedom uh, and divine freedom um, and gets God some kind of strong account of foreknowledge and strong th theory of providence? Molinism is the only robust theory in town. Um, my friend uh, Ryan Byerly has this account that he calls the time ordering account um, that's supposed to overcome some problems for uh, for Molinism, such as like the grounding objection. And I think 
it's a nice story to tell. It's not as developed and has not been as rigorously defended as Lake Molinism because he's the only person who's laid this theory out. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's interesting. But the, his particular account of the grounding to solve the grounding objection, it relies on some really highly technical issues in philosophy of time that I could explain at some point if you want. Um, but I think it's much easier to just go this entire theory of truth maker theory that Molin or that the grounding objection is resting on is just ridiculous. So we can just get rid of that. And it's much simpler. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I end up, what I end up getting at the end of the day is with uh, Ryan Byerly's time ordering account looks just very much like Molinism. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's not like a ton of evidence, though. It's just to go, hey, yeah, John, my friend John Peckham, he gave some really good biblical arguments. Trust me, go read them. Uh, and Molinism is the only theory I know that can really kind of accommodate all those things. And I, I think that <clears throat> I think the tendency to is to be. Um, prone to or desiring mm -hmm. a permanent wedded oh like well you you affirm calvinism so you are a calvinist now you're in you're a molinist you are a molinist now that's it and i think that um one of the things that i love about getting together with those who disagree with me is that it provokes thought and it challenges and so uh you know getting out of the the echo chamber and um, and hearing from a different perspective. And so, um, yeah, I, I think, I think that, um, I think it does us really good to hear from those who would say, well, I don't believe God thinks, and we get to hear those arguments and see if they're persuasive, but those who argue that God has middle knowledge and all that Molinism entails. And then, um, now, uh, one of the things Sam says here is that we all believe God has foreknowledge. It's just a question of the nature and extent of that foreknowledge. But as you've said, if you believe God is atemporal, you don't technically believe he has foreknowledge because that means knowledge before, which is itself assuming temporality. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I would say everyone, and I think, I think Sam is hitting on something and, and perhaps it needs to be drawn out. We all operate on the premise that God is temporal until we get into the realm of theory. Yep. And I think that's right. Um, so so actually, uh, my friend Larry Launanen, he's um, he has a PhD in cognitive science of religion. Uh, we co-authored a paper that's an open access paper in the journal Religions, and it's called um, Why Open Theism is, is Natural, but, but Classical Theism is Not. Uh, mm -hmm. and the reason we had to cut out, uh, we had to cut out neo neoclassical theism, which is the view that I, I like more. Um, we didn't have space for it. Um, so but we wanted to make, we had all these arguments before, like, well, this is also like super intuitive. Uh, so what, what Larry and I do there is we look at just cognitive science and religion and go, what are the most natural, most intuitive views for humans to affirm, uh, about God and ultimate reality and divine temporalities is super intuitive whereas divine timelessness is highly counterintuitive. So when you look at what people say when they're trying to describe the timeless God, they just can't help but fall back into temporal language. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this countless times throughout the entire Christian tradition when I'm reading through all these systematic theology textbooks. And then what Larry brings to the table is to go, here's all these, uh, all this like research that the sci cognitive scientists have done to look at how people today are just trying to describe timeless realities. And again, they just can't help but fall into temporal language and go, yeah, maybe God's really just temporal. Yeah, so I think it we seems, can't help it. It seems to be that if reality is so clearly temporal, that to argue otherwise would be arguing against reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and at some point, if God is the source and sustainer, if he's the foundation for reality, it seems like we're not just going against reality, but we're going against the revelation of God that he's put into his creation. Yeah. So it, it, it will really give you quite the migraine if you try to think and operate in this realm of atemporality, I mean, it, it, we're, we're, we just simply struggle with that. Um, now, you mentioned neoclassical mm -hmm. theism. So we've talked about Calvinism, Molinism, open theism. We've talked about classical theism. Could Before we let you go, could you tell us a little bit about what is the distinctive in neoclassical theism? Yeah, so classical theism wants to affirm um, like all your standard like omni attributes and that God's got perfect freedom and rationality, all that stuff. But everybody, you know, affirms that stuff, so it's not interesting. Uh, so classical theism says God has four unique attributes, which are timelessness, uh, immutability, uh, impassibility, and simplicity. Uh, and then they, when they look at omniscience, they'll say the modal scope uh, or like the scope of God's omniscience extends to the future because God's 
either a Calvinist or a Molinist. He's just, you know, created one of these kind of universes. Uh, what the neoclassical theist does is go, they'll, they'll say one of those four classical attributes, timelessness, immutability, uh, simplicity, or impassibility, I want to reject one or more of those. But I want to agree, though, that God's knowledge, um, he does create a universe, either a Calvinist universe or a Molinist universe, so his knowledge does extend to the future. So I'm not going to be an open theist. Mm. Um, but you're going to be rejecting something like timelessness. So for me, I want to go timelessness, get rid of it. Immutability, I don't need that. I just need the claim that God's essence doesn't change. Mm. Uh, simplicity, that's gobbledygook. Get rid of it. Impassibility, that's that's the most anti-biblical thing you could ever imagine. Uh, of course, God's got a wide range of emotions, and he's impacted by the, the world he creates. Um, so I want to get rid of all four of them, but there are a lot of people who, like Linda Zygzebski, she wants to go timelessness, totally awesome, immutability, fantastic, simplicity, I think so, um, impassibility, no, go away. Um, so they wanted to reject just like one of those four classical attributes. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of wiggle room within the neoclassical view, but you're still affirming, uh, like some sort of definite exhaustive foreknowledge at some point, depending on what kind of universe God created. Mm -hmm. Okay. Makes sense. It makes sense. Um, now, Ryan, uh, we've, we're coming up on the hour and a half mark. Mm -hmm. yep. It's flown by. You, you've been a delight and uh, very informative. Um, and you've promoted my merch. Yeah, uh, there we go. You know, I mean, <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pencil you in for another one of these. There um, we go. I'd love to have you back. We've got to figure out some other topic that we can get uh, feathers ruffled. But uh, is there anything you want to say before before we bid you farewell, sir? Um, no, not much. I mean, again, like you plugged my show earlier. So yeah, just check out the Reluctant Theologian podcast. You can also go to my website, uh, rtmullins.com and find uh, as many papers as I'm allowed to, to to put on there for open access. And you have those two books that we link to in the uh, mm -hmm. in the description that uh, you can order on, on Amazon. I've got your uh, God and Emotions uh, book, and I'm finishing that up right now. And I'm going to be moving on to the other one. Uh, as soon as I get a, a free moment as well. But Ryan, thank you so much, sir. Uh, and guys, definitely go check out the Reluctant Theologian podcast and those links. And we'll put some, I think I left off a few in the description. That's my, you've got too much going on. I do. Too much going on for me to keep up with, but I will put that in the uh, description uh, as soon as we log out here. But thank you guys so much. Thanks for the questions, Ryan. Thank you, sir. And until next time, guys, uh, God bless. The only way to get there was to float through the terrifying void between us.